You make no friends in the pits and you take no prisoners. One minute you're up half a million in soybeans and the next, boom, your kids don't go to college and they've repossessed your Bentley. Are you with me? The revolution starts now. Starts now. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Turn those machines back on! You are about to enter the Peter Schiff Show. Show me the money! If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on Earth. The Peter Schiff Show is on. Call in now. 855-4-SHIFT. That's 855-472-4433. I don't know when they decided that they wanted to make a virtue out of selfishness. Your money, your stories, your freedom. The Peter Schiff Show. Welcome, everybody. This is Peter Schiff here at ShiffRadio.com. We're taking your calls. The number is working today, 855-4-SHIFF, 855-4-SHIFF, if you want to be part of today's program. Well, we're off to a pretty uh, uh, volatile start here in the markets. The Dow Jones is down about 110 points pretty much every day, it seems like. Uh, we're starting off with 100 to 150-point swings. The big news, though, is going on in the gold market and the treasury market. I think in response to a comment made this morning on CNBC by the uh, uh, president of Chicago uh, Federal Reserve Bank, Charles Evans, who's also a voting member of the FOMC, he told CNBC that he was in favor, basically, of quantitative easing three, QE3. And that got the, the market thinking about more money printing and more treasury buying by the Fed. And as a result, Treasury prices are rising. You're seeing a pretty big drop in yields and a big increase in the price of government of Treasury's 10-year and 30-year. Now, why is that? Well, because if the government is going to buy something, when the government buys it, that means the price goes up because they're in their buying. But the problem is, where does the Fed get the money to buy the Treasuries? Well, it creates it out of thin air. It prints it. And so when the Federal Reserve creates money to buy treasuries, it devalues money. Now, treasuries are simply obligations to pay dollars in the future. But by printing dollars to buy treasuries, the Fed makes dollars less valuable. So by definition, treasuries become less valuable when the Fed prints money to buy them. Now, in the short run, the price may go up because of the trading mechanisms of the Fed coming in and bidding up prices. But by printing money to bid up those prices, it ultimately means that the treasuries that they're buying are worth a lot less because the interest payments and the principal payments will buy less in terms of everything you want to buy. Certainly in terms of gold, the price of gold is surging today by about $40 an ounce based on these comments. So obviously, treasuries, dollars, will buy a lot less gold uh, now that this you know, announcement has come out. And, of course, over time, the number of ounces you'll be able to buy for your dollars will continue to diminish. Now, against other currencies, the dollar is not <clears throat> really falling today. It's down a bit against the Australian dollar and the New Zealand dollar, but it's up against other currencies, mainly the European currencies, the euro. You know, they got weak economic data. They got consumer confidence numbers out of the eurozone today that were the lowest since December of 2008. And you remember what was going on at that time. And so, you know, the market is kind of it's, it's almost schizophrenic between who do we want to worry about, Europe or the U.S. Obviously, there are concerns on both sides of the Atlantic, but by far, Uh, The more immediate, the more severe problems, I believe, are in the United States rather than Europe. And I think the the market is missing uh, the mark when it pays too much attention to Europe at the expense of the dollar. But obviously, gold going up shows that there are problems with both currencies. But printing money to buy bonds is decisively negative for bonds because the worst thing that can happen to a bond holder is inflation, is that the value of their bonds in real purchasing power is diminished. And that is what is happening. Now, oil prices are up. We're up back at about $88 a barrel. So oil prices are responding to the fear of more money printing. But in general, a lot of commodity prices are are still, well, the CRB is up a bit. But I think what we need to see, and we will see, is a lot of the industrial or economically sensitive commodities 
that are being dragged down as people are worried about global recession. At some point, the inflationary forces will overwhelm uh, the deflationary forces of uh, slower economies. And you will see uh, across the board increases in prices as a result of Fed money printing and the promises of additional Fed money printing. And I've been saying uh, for a long time now uh, that QE3 was coming, even when others said that there was no way it was going to come. In fact, I remember one time on CNBC, uh, Steve Leisman was on, and, and someone tried to bet him uh, that there would be a QE3, and Steve Leisman said it's impossible, and he offered him five-to-one odds, and I immediately emailed Steve Leisman to put me down for ten grand on that bet. He's trying to weasel his way out of it now, but anyway, that I, I, I took him up on the bet. The other guy was only willing to bet him a lunch. Uh, I had a lot more confidence. In fact, I said I would be willing to up the bet if you wanted to, but I, I figured as a, as a reporter he didn't have that much money, and I figured maybe 50 grand was all the guy could afford to lose on a 5-to-1, on, a, on, a uh, on 10 grand. But I was confident that it, that it would, in fact, uh, happen and so and I think what uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Fed president said is one of the reasons that this new this next FOMC meeting has been lengthened by a couple of days and Ben Bernanke himself mentioned that the meeting was going to be longer at his Jackson Hole speech is that they're going to obviously be discussing more aggressive a monetary policy and in particular how they could do QE3 now will they actually label it a QE3 I don't know. I've been saying that I think they might come up with another name uh, because, of course, QE3 really means inflation. That's really what they mean when they say quantitative easing. They mean create inflation. So the Fed can come up with some other euphemism uh, for inflation because they don't like to call it what it is. Because if they say our policy is to create inflation, some people might think, but but why? I don't want inflation. Prices are already too high. I don't want higher prices. So when the Fed creates inflation, they don't want to call it inflation because it doesn't have a positive connotation. But quantitative easing, you know, somehow that sounds like, well, that, that, that must be pretty good. I mean, that sounds really fancy. These guys must know what they're doing. This is, you know, quantitative. I mean, that sounds like, you know, really sophisticated kind of thing and easy. Well, hey, that's good. I mean, we'd rather have things easy than difficult, right? So quantitative easing kind of sounds like it's a good thing, but it's a bad thing. And if you want to know why the cost of living is going up, it's because of quantitative easing, why things are more expensive. Well, quantitative easing. And, of course, there's been so much quantitative easing, even before they officially came up with that term, that, you know, all the GDP growth, I think, of the last several years has been manufactured because the economy is really contracting. But when the government tries to take nominal GDP and deflate it to make it real, they're using a deflator that doesn't even come close to capturing the true extent of the money printing of the inflation or quantitative easing that's going on. You know, before I forget, too, you know, I got another email in my inbox today, again, with a lot of uh, my words being uh, parroted back to me by that criminal organization known as the National Inflation Association. And what's really insulting to me is in the email today, they're trying again. They they're claiming credit for a lot of the forecasts that they made that have come true, and then they say that most of our forecasts are unique to us. None of their forecasts are unique to them. All of their forecasts come from me. They simply look at what I'm saying and they just copy it. So if I forecast something, they forecast it. Of course, they're they're not forecasting anything. They're just repeating what I've already said. And then of course, since a lot of the things that I've said have have have, have happened, they claim credit. Uh, for these, and then they use that credibility to con people into their penny stock pump and dumps. So, you know, they end every one of their emails by saying it's important to spread the word about the NIA. That's the one thing they're right. It's important to spread the word that this organization is a, is a scam, that they're a front for penny stock promoters and illegal pump and dump schemes. And anybody who is a member of this organization uh, should uh, drop out of it and spread the word uh, to anyone else that you know that if you are a member, you should unsubscribe and stay away from any stocks that these guys recommend. Anyway, don't go away. we got a lot more coming up here on The Peter Schiff Show on shiftradio.com, the gold standard in talk radio. The Peter, the Peter Schiff Show. To President Obama, Secretary Geithner, Madam Pelosi, and all of the socialist econ professors across America. We're sorry. We're sorry. Peter Schiff is back on the air. And we are back. This is Peter Schiff here at SchiffRadio.com. And, you know, we got some economic news this morning 
on housing. We got home prices that came out for June. The year-on-year decline in the 20-city K-Shiller Index was 4.5%. Now, I guess if you want to try to make lemonade out of these lemons, you can go back to the month prior where the year-on-year decline was something like 6%, which was uh, the biggest decline year-over-year in several years. Uh, yeah, five, I think it was 5.9% was the June number uh, or the May number. Uh, but the numbers are still very weak. And you know what? They're going to get a lot weaker. Uh, you know, even even Washington, D.C., in this most recent month, declined. I mean, all 20 of the case shiller cities in the index declined, including Washington, D.C., although Washington, D.C. had the smallest decline of any city. The largest decline, I think, was that um, – where was that? Detroit or uh, someplace. Not there was a Detroit. I'm we'll trying to find where it was. But there was one city that was down uh, 12%. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Minneapolis, 11% drop in Minneapolis. Not sure why the Twin City, or at least one of the Twin Cities, was so particularly weak, but that's what happened in, in Minneapolis. But, look, these numbers are going to continue to weaken, especially as more and more of the foreclosed properties actually make it on the markets. I mean, many of the banks have been hesitant and reluctant to foreclose, and I criticized the banks this for doing this a year or two ago because a lot of the banks were hoping – that if they just didn't foreclose, that the real estate market would turn around and that they wouldn't lose as much. But instead, they're going to lose more, and I predicted as much. Also, too, I, I read an article last week on the show that said one of the reasons that a lot of the banks don't want to foreclose is there are, lot, there are a lot of these condominiums out there where if the bank forecloses, then the bank owns it, and they have to start paying the homeowner's fees, the association dues. And so they don't foreclose. And therefore, they don't have to pay the dues. But the problem is for the, 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 the communities because now no one is paying the dues because the person who is living there mortgage free is also not paying his association dues, which is why a lot of these condominium associations are suing the banks, trying to force them to foreclose, because by not foreclosing, they're damaging the other homeowners who now have to pay higher assessments because uh, the, there's other guys who are living there uh, paying nothing, which shows, again, the, the moral hazards involved in what the government's doing. Also, want to talk before I take grab some phone calls before our guests coming up at the next break. I talked yesterday again about how cheap uh, the gold mining stocks are. Well, yesterday, I didn't realize at the time, but there was a takeover uh, in the gold industry um, the, 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 the company being acquired Northgate Minerals Corporation, which is a stock that I personally own. I've owned it for a long time and I'm just mentioning it as full disclosure. Again, I'm not making an investment recommendation. In fact, the stock is being taken over now, so there's nothing even to do with respect to the stock, but it's being taken over by a company I've never even heard of, uh, or Rico Gold Incorporated. I, I I don't own them. I don't have, I've never recommended the stock. So I, and again, I'm not recommending it now, but they're the acquirer of uh, of uh, of Northgate Minerals. But the interesting part about this deal, and I'm reading this Reuters re- news story right now, is they're buying Northgate for 14.7 times earnings, right? This is a takeover, and this is the cheapest deal, the cheapest a company has been bought out since 2004. 2004, gold prices were around $450 an ounce back then, and this is the cheapest takeover. In fact, they're saying that this deal is a 64% discount uh, to the deal with Kinross Gold, which I also owned, which bought out Redback Mining, which I also owned. And so both, but that stock that was done, and I still own Kinross, um, again, not recommending it, just I own it. But anyway, um, and but th- th- this deal is a 64% discount to that deal, even though the price of gold, is something like, I don't know, uh, 30% higher than it was, maybe more than this last deal was done. And again, what all this is showing is that, the, that there's nobody buying these gold stocks. And as long as these stocks are so inexpensive, why should any gold company, a major gold mining company, why should they spend money exploring for gold, looking to develop new gold resources, when all they have to do is go out and buy another company for a steal. And so I think, A, that that, that argues uh, uh, in favor of buying these gold stocks when I think there's so much opportunity uh, for takeover and consolidation, but it also is bullish for gold itself. 